Hello, I'm Zonal Fair and welcome to another video on the TechQuest. Initially, I had planned on testing the Trig Key Mini PC this week, but a part I had on order actually arrived ahead of time in a refreshing change, so we're going to be taking a look at something I've had a couple of requests for, the Athlon 3000G. The Athlon 3000G, to which I will just refer to as a 3000G from here on in, is a 2-core 4-thread processor on socket AM4. Released and subsequently re-released rather recently, you can still buy these new for around £40 where you can find them. For that money, you get a dual-core processor with SMT clocked in at a reasonable 3.5GHz and it also features onboard graphics, the Radeon Vega 3, although we won't be taking a look at the iGPU today. The Athlon is a cheap chip designed for system builders who make PCs your grand can browse Facebook on. From a performance perspective, it's a low-cost processor designed for very light work. It features 4 megs of R3 cache and an unlocked multiplier for easy overclocking. We'll start this opening off with realistic expectations. The 3000G isn't a gaming processor. In fact, at this price point there are a number of Ryzen processors that will perform much better than the 3000G. And I want to be clear here, you should absolutely buy those chips above the Athlon if you're planning on any gaming. This is not the use case for the Athlon 3000G at all. But since we are going to use it for gaming today, let's at least give the Athlon 3000G the best opportunity to stretch its legs. Normally you'd drop this in a cheap A320 board, add in a bit of memory and be away. But I've gone a little overboard in the test bench today. First of all, we've applied a very slight overclock to the 3000G, a nudge up to 3.7GHz. Higher than this required voltage changes, 4GHz was achieved at 1.4V, but I like to keep things simple here, so 3.7GHz is what we're going to stick with. Officially, the 3000G supports up to 2666MHz memory, but we've gone a little further here. We've put in 32GB of RAM, running at 3200MHz, and it's absolutely fine. For the graphics card, we've gone overboard on that too. I've paired up the RTX 2060 for today's testing with the Athlon, and it is a card you'll be seeing more of here as I plan on using this on lower spec builds in future videos. It features 6GB of VRAM, and it's a nice little card with decent performance. The slight downside here is that we are limited to PCIe 3 4 times, as even when disabled, the Athlon's iGPU takes up 4 available PCIe lanes. It will have some effect on performance, but there's not really a lot we can do here, as this is a CPU limitation. I've put all this together on a solid board, an Asus Tough B550 Plus Wi-Fi, and complete with Windows 11 and most games running from an MSI Spaceship SSD. The Athlon only supports SATA storage, so we're working within the processor's limitations here again. The full specs of this system are on screen now, an entirely overkill setup for the 3000G, but it can't be said that we didn't give it its fair shot. We have a lot to cover, including a couple of new games previously requested to testing, so let's get to it. All footage today is captured using an NZXT signal capture card connected to a separate PC. So what you see here is what you should expect to see on a similar configuration. Fallout 4 is first as always, at 1080p and using the high preset. We actually got a really decent time out of the Athlon 3000G. I always aim for at least 15 minutes of my testing, but I actually lost track of time here and ended up playing much longer than I expected and it was a good overall level of performance from the dual core Athlon. The average was 59.7 FPS, with a 1% figure at 45.2 FPS. The 0.1% figure wasn't superb, a value that will repeat throughout today's testing at 6.9 FPS, but as you can see from the footage here, you'll get by absolutely fine. Moving on, Dying Light 2 was sadly a no-go. At 1080p using the game's high preset, the Athlon couldn't deliver anywhere near a consistent experience here, and my time with Dying Light 2 was plagued with stuttering that just didn't ease up. Average was 33.7, but the percentile lows were terrible due to the processor spending the entire time maxed out. 1% was 2, and 0.1% was just 1.1 FPS, so overall not very good. Red Dead Redemption though was pretty good. At 1080p and using the game's high preset, riding through the outback would see a solid frame rate well into the 70s, with a slight hit to performance as you hit towns like Armadillo, which, to be fair, isn't unique to the Athlon. Average frame rate was 63.7, with good percentile numbers too. 37.2 and 21 FPS for the 1% and 0.1% figures respectively. So you'll have a plenty good time here. I had planned on testing Horizon Zero Dawn for the video today. However, I'm not sure what was going on here, but I just couldn't get it to run at all. Dead Island 2 was actually quite a surprise. At 1080p and using the game's medium preset, the Athlon did much better than I expected. And we saw better than Xbox One performance here. It wasn't perfect, and the frame rate was a little inconsistent, but it was a lot more playable than I thought it would be, and there's a good time to be had here, if you manage your expectations going in. Average was 46.8 FPS, with a decent 1% low of 30.5 FPS, 0.1 was 7.4 FPS. 
Grand Theft Auto 5 is up now, this time the legacy version. There's no two ways about it, this is absolutely not playable at all, at any settings, and we see all the hallmark problems of dual course running GTA 5, missing textures, constant stuttering and all. The Athlon is a dual core processor, and performance on processors with only two cores has always been terrible in GTA 5. The Athlon itself isn't unique with this kind of poor performance, GTA 5 just doesn't seem to run well on any dual core processor at all. Unfortunately, this unplayability also runs over into Red Dead Redemption 2. At 1080p and using the high preset, we saw a barely 20fps frame rate almost the entire time, even outside of towns. The Athlon simply doesn't have the performance needed here to run Red Dead 2 at anything near okay frame rates. Average was 23.9, with percentile figures also looking just as grim, at 12.6 and 4.2fps for the 1% and 0.1% numbers respectively. Frostpunk makes a good run on the Athlon. At 1080p high, the 3000G managed perfectly fine here. With Frostpunk's more GPU-centric ways taxing the RTX 2060 more than the 3000G, it was okay, complete with that stubborn 60fps cap that seemed to come with it. But other than that, absolutely fine. Metro Last Light Redux also had no issues on the 3000G. At 1080p and using the high preset, we saw a frame rate well into triple digits during my playthrough of the Echoes level, and overall it was a solid, consistent experience, as you would expect. Interesting side note, this is where the GPU power demand actually peaked out of all the testing today, a 187 watts power draw. Metro's average was a healthy 181.4, with excellent percentile numbers, 1% at 118.3, and 0.1% at 89.5 FPS. Spider-Man makes its first appearance on the channel. It's often been requested, now it's added to testing. At 1080p and using the medium preset, I'm actually conflicted about this one. This actually felt mostly playable, albeit a bit inconsistent, but the percentile figures weren't very good. There was a brief occasional stutter that I am assuming is traversal related, but once the Athlon cleared that up, the game actually didn't feel that bad to play. So ultimately this being playable is going to be quite subjective. I didn't mind outside of the occasional hiccup, but obviously you might differ on that opinion. Average was an okay 48.6 FPS, with percentile numbers not being great at 1.4 for 1% and 1.1 for 0.1%. I still found this okay though. Dying Light was a good performer overall. At 1080p high, the Athlon got by absolutely fine, and this was plenty playable enough. Bigger crowds of zombies would drop the frame rate a little, something I'm sure is CPU related, but overall this was more than good enough, and I could play like this quite happily. Average was 63.9, with okay percentile figures to match. 1% at 40.7, and even 0.1% being decent at 23.3 FPS. Not bad overall. Left 4 Dead 2 is quite old now, but remains popular to this day. With that in mind, the 3000G performs rather nicely. At 1080p and with everything maxed out, you'll have absolutely no issues running Left 4 Dead 2, as again you would expect. Average was 187.2, with 1% being 82.6, and 0.1% at 28.6. So, Left 4 Dead 2 should be a solid, consistent experience for you on the Athlon. Counter Strike 2 is up now, and it was a very mixed bag. The Athlon spent most of its time maxed out, and that resulted in a wildly inconsistent frame rate that went from just about playable, if nothing spectacular, to like wading through treacle. I did struggle a little to get into this due to the frame rate, and I wouldn't consider it particularly playable overall, especially given that this is an online competitive game, and you won't really be competing with anyone at this sort of performance. The average was 38.6 FPS, with percentile figures coming in much lower, 16.6 and 11.2 FPS for 1% and 0.1% respectively. Cyberpunk 2077 did not do well at all, at 1080p and using the game's medium preset with DLS enabled with ray tracing, the Athlon just struggled. There were moments where the frame rate did reach above 30 FPS, but this just wasn't really going anywhere as the Athlon is a bottleneck here. Average was 24.9 FPS, with 1% lows being quite low at 10.7 FPS for 1%, and 6.5 FPS for 0.1%. Unfortunately, not playable on the Athlon. Borderlands 2 ran absolutely fine at 1080p high. This is one of those games that really seemed to favour Intel processors back in the day, but that didn't stop the dual core Athlon from making this a breeze. Average was 87.8 FPS, with decent returns on the percentile figures. 1% was 54.8, with 0.1% at 38.3, so you're in for a consistent overall experience here. Saints Row 3 Remastered is our penultimate game today, at 1080p and using the high preset, the Athlon did struggle a little with this one despite the numbers. 
After running my bench test though, I could feel that the 3000G was almost there with performance, and capping the game to 60fps rather than uncapped actually made the game stutter a lot less, and the game became a lot more playable as a result of that. My advice would be to cap this one to 60fps for better results. Bench figures though were 65.6fps average, 13 for 1%, and just 6.8fps for 0.1%. I think a force cap is the way to go here. And finally, Fallout New Vegas plays absolutely fine. No figures for this one, but you'll be patrolling the Mojave with absolutely no problem outside of, well, you know, the apocalypse. And that's a wrap for today. The AMD Athlon 3000G isn't a processor gamers should be buying in 2025, but simply, it was never meant for this kind of use, and in some cases, the fact that a lot of these games still play very well even newer ones, is a good example of how solid AMD's Zen architecture is. This Zen-based processor is mostly for value system builders who make machines that people will only ever be browsing on. It's an unremarkable processor designed for a very specific market segment. It's not a bad processor, far from it. It'll handle your day-to-day -day tasks, browsing and video playback absolutely fine with everything on the chip, including the iGPU, exactly as it was designed to do. If you're looking at building a dirt cheap AM4 based gaming rig though, you should probably look elsewhere. In both retail and second-hand pricing, the Athlon 3000G is so close to processors such as the Ryzen 4500 that you should absolutely buy those instead. A couple of months ago I reviewed the Ryzen 4100, a processor that you can buy for £30 new today and even that will run laps around the Athlon. Sure, you'll need a dedicated GPU to use those, but you are likely already planning on doing that anyway. If you're looking at something cheap with onboard graphics, then I'd suggest taking a look on the used market for something like a Ryzen 2400G, as they will also be more performant than the Athlon. If you're looking to play older titles, you'll likely get by absolutely fine with the 3000G. All of the older games tested today actually ran pretty well, but anything modern will bring about the obvious limitations of this dual-core processor real sharpish. It's not a bad processor at all, it just isn't suitable for any serious modern gaming. With all that said, I've been Zonoff here, and thank you very much for watching the Athlon 3000G on the TechQuest. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and until next time, bye bye.